Because I've got you, I've got you. facilitating this keynote chat with a woman I've known for many, many years. She is amazing. She deserves every single accolade that she has received over the last 10 or 15 years working in the music business. She's not only a DJ, she's a producer, she's a record label boss, and I have to write these all down because there's so many jobs that she does. A curator of not only sounds, but also of incredible artists, and she's also an artist manager. And she's one of the most committed and hardworking and inspiring women that I know, and uh, she certainly deserved that billboard with her face enlarged on Times Square in New York City when she was part of that Spotify campaign. You are very lucky to hear her thoughts today on building a brand from both a non-commercial perspective and a commercial perspective. She worked in both of those realms and has become quite an expert in all of them. I know her as Nina Agzarian and you know her as the amazing, the incredible Nina Las Vegas. Welcome. Oh, thanks, Missy. <laughs> it's so great to be able to talk to you about, you know, the years of your success. I knew you from my Triple J day. I was on the way out and you were essentially beginning your career yeah. then and from that time you have built up one of the most I guess respected not only dance labels but brand your own brand Nina Las Vegas in the country if not on a global scale so let's go back to those triple day days and talk to me about that that young woman what were you thinking what were your hopes what were your dreams and what did you achieve Wow, thanks, yeah. Miff. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay, so I was just a hustler from the start. I always found a gap, and I found a gap in production because when I was at uni, no one was interested in sound design. I always was. I love music. I played music. And Triple J was next to UTS. So <laughs> it's literally, that's how I met Shuf. I'm, I'm going to throw out some So UTS names. is Sydney University, yeah, University of Technology. Yeah, and so I did... Uh, Media, oh man, I can't, a design degree, which I actually appreciate now. Um, and I also did a sound engineering major and then did but loads of uh, work experience, which I, where I kind of, kind of ma made myself irreplaceable. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there's, um, you know, shout out the, the old mob in charge. So like Chris Scott and Linda Bracken, Mark Scott, those people really just never let me leave from podcasting. Mm. And I was a producer at first, and then House Party started. I made myself available to mix a show, and then I made myself the only one that could host a show. <laughs> <laughs> and like repeatedly said, like, this is my show. The name in Las Vegas was one of those organic, Oh my God, thank you, Scott Dooley. He just called me it from day one, just like Nina Las Vegas. <laughs> and you cannot like thank that organic brand development from the start. Mm. You know, like I just always had a pseudonym from yeah. the get go. Um, House Party started, there were lots of mixed CDs at the time. Um, I kind of was always that person to just say, hey, why don't we do this? Mm. Um, I think, you know, you and a lot of the, um, I don't know, I'm an aging millennial, so you're... I'm, I'm too old. I don't even have it. I don't even <laughs> have right. a title the, anymore. The but you, you showed something, in, and we could see that in you. Like, you were, you were so driven, and you were so I enthusiastic. Just <laughs> <laughs> I just was like, I'll do that, I'll do that. I'm like, I was part of, like, the web team for a minute. <laughs> like, I just made myself really skilled yeah. and, and, and really know the brand. As I'd come from rural Australia, it's all I knew. Yeah. Um, I think then with House Party was kind of special because because I, I worked out that the ABC loves ideas coming to them. And I kind of uh, like learned that from an early age. So, because um, I was there since I was 18. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there was no choice. Uh, I, I went to SCADS and I was like, hey, why don't we do a mix CD? Because I was getting offers from other brands. And like knowing that system, because it's the only thing I'd ever know, like the brand, Triple J, ABC, they want to own everything. So mm. if I came to them and said, um, hey, can we do this? It kind of happened. And even the fact that, well, I'm an older sibling. You're, you're not. So, like, I was the person that would get in trouble first and then the younger siblings. <laughs> so I was, like, DJing without telling them. And then why can't I have my name next to Triple J? All this stuff, like, why can't I say Facebook on air? Mm. And all this stuff that now we take 
is just part of the station, you know? They literally hired a TikTok employee and I was just like, what the hell? Yeah, because back in those days, we couldn't actually do anything or acknowledge any of those brands on air. Yeah. And it's a totally different environment today. And I think you're a perfect person for this because you've encapsulated the ability to meld both of those worlds yeah. and you know how to navigate both of those worlds. Yeah. And in fact, you're quite the trailblazer in ensuring that those worlds intertwined in a very realistic way. Well, they should. Yeah, because, because like, that's the world we live in yeah, now. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I wasn't the only one. Like, I'd, upper management believed that too. They were dealing with the bigger people at B that, that mm. kind of make those calls. But I do feel like I was... I, I have no idea how we got a, a tour happening now because, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> but I, I do think those were kind of simpler times and more complicated mm. times. Yeah. So, you know, we were able to run, like, a house party with Bloom, who I apologise for how much we paid him at the time. <laughs> I went to that house yeah, party. It was amazing. But yeah, and then like the merch, NLV just uh, happened because it was easier to write than like Nina Las Vegas. Georgia Perry, who's an amazing designer, happened to just nail this shirt. And then it's just one of those things where I would see when something bubbles and roll with it mm. and be like, oh, my God, everyone's buying this shirt. we got to make more. And so when I left, I started a label with um, Jadon, actually, um, from Unified, because I found this niche. I'm like, there's no one representing this side of club music. Um, it's been very hard, but I'm proud of it. And NLV just kind of stuck. And uh, and it just, I thought about different names for my label and, and different things. And, and I think NLV Records has kind of surpassed me now. So, mm. like, that's the goal, to leave a legacy. And, like, NLV Records is just a story, not necessarily a person. What did you learn from that experience coming through and not being able to partner and not being able to, to make money from, from other partnerships and other brands? What did you learn about that that you now take into your day-to-day -day experience when it comes to who you decide to partner with? Well, I think you'd find this too. Uh, when you're at the ABC and for so long, you, you are so lucky to have a brand built in for you. Like, mm. we c I was there around the 40th, and what is it, like 65 now? Like, well, <laughs> it's as old as yeah. me, Nina. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, so old. Um, and as I am, I am 36. Like, I don't think people realise, like, I've been doing this so long. And, and I think what I really learnt, and, you know, uh, like... Chris Gatton knows this, and he's, he's the head of radio at the ABC, but he just hammered into me, like, at the time, potentially to help his work, <laughs> but just, like, be selective. Like, what you have is cool. You haven't had to try to be cool. It's there, and, you, like, he just, he made me really see my value, and that's what I take in outside. And even, like, because you had moved on past that, you'd, flit, like, fleeted between you know, corporate, non-corporate, mm. commercial. And, like, we could have honest conversations. And I, I like, am dangerously a big talker. I talk a lot. And if you know me, I, I like, don't share a secret. Um, <laughs> but I will ask. I'll be like, how much did you get? Yeah. What was that? What's happening? Why did you do that? Like, what was the outcome? Like, how mm. does it make you feel? All those questions that we were forced to kind of think about when thinking about the greater national Triple J audience, mm. I take into now. Yeah, it, it's about choosing and being selective and working with people that represent, I guess, the ideals and the values that you've established over those 15 years before they could have access to yeah. you. It's really important, yeah. isn't it? I think as well, it, it doesn't have to be... Like, I would constantly find a niche. Like, that was my favourite mm. thing. Like, find what was missing and explore that. Yeah. And, like, see where the gaps are. And I think that's been kind of my ethos in everything. Like, I don't really want to do what everyone else is doing, mm. um, you know? And, and I think that's why I've been on a gap year ever since I've left <laughs> <laughs> Triple J. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, you run a label, you DJ, you nurture new artists and you develop new artists as well and you've been incredibly successful doing that. Do people know how much work there is behind the scenes no. and how does that affect when you do partner with people? How does that affect, you know, that relationship given you're so busy? I think, um, I think that's the one thing, unfortunately, that systematically should change. Like, I don't think people realise how much I'm doing myself. Um, I also, you know, have a very supportive partner that enjoys me not around. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The ideal partner. <laughs> so I, um, no, I, I am able to work a lot. And, and I think the thing is that's happened since the pandemic coming home because I was 
kind of cavorting around the world. And, um, and I think that what I've really changed this past year is identifying that me as a person, Nina Las Vegas, Nina Exarian, is a businesswoman and I am capable of these really big campaigns and decisions. And, and if I'm not, I work out how to be. So I think it's weird, but I think the one thing I lack is that PR and that confidence that you kind of, I mean, we all get the Industry Observer email, we see it every day, like who wants to tell everyone what's their, what they're doing. Mm. I want to tell everyone what the wins are. So yeah. I sit back, but it doesn't mean that I'm not in everyone's grill behind the scenes. Mm. It doesn't mean that I'm not like, I'm not, you know, driving my former workplace mad with emails about music or driving Spotify or Apple mad with like, why isn't this here? Like I question a lot. I, um, and, and I think that fear of being, it's not going to stop my business. Like I think when you work across artists and music and your brand, if it's truly you, you kind of do whatever you want including fuck up, but including like push people. Mm. So I think that's, yeah. Well, let's talk about some of those partnerships. And I mentioned the Spotify billboard oh, that yeah. was in Times Square, your face all over it, oh. LA, everywhere. I thought it was a deck. I thought they were joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was so used to decks at this point. I'm like, oh. What's a just, deck? Like, a, I thought they were proposing the outcome um, of like the concept of the women program that I was part of. Mm. And the thing I have to point out too, I am as a, record label boss as an artist manager and as an artist myself, I actually am very neutral to all the DSPs. I feel very strongly about maintaining a healthy relationship with them. And I think each do really well. And uh, I, I can't get into arguments about streaming and stuff because like it's all I've known. Mm. So I just roll with it, you know? And I think that's the same with like, I'm never jaded about new technology. In fact, I think it's so good. So. <laughs> I might be a bit ridiculous and jump on board everything, but I think it's really important too. Um, I think with the spot of their thing, that was really organic because I kept at them about dance music and mm. I kept at them about why we weren't seeing more diversity in the list. And it is algorithm based and it is audience based, but my label and the records, we push alternative music. So it is hard to get that cruisy playlist yeah. win. Doesn't mean it's not valued, doesn't mean they're not trying. So I, for the last year, have been working with Spotify on Track IDs, which is a new initiative they have where I do a playlist. And I just thought they would just ask me to do something, which as an artist, we all know, we, we do stuff for the players, we do stuff for the platforms, and we, we do stuff to get our word out. Um, and yeah, then they put me on a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the heck? <laughs> a shout out like Taylor Martin, this young photographer in Walgar. She has a billboard in New York Times. That's like, amazing. I, I that is amazing. So cool. um, but what's essentially happening here is you, you've worked so hard to establish who you are, what you do, and what it is that people want to get around. Yeah. And so in a way, it's 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 brands tapping into what you have to op offer. How do you keep your sense of, um, I guess, strength when it comes to, you know, perhaps them asking, not that they necessarily would, but, but some brands, some partnerships might ask more than perhaps you want to give, well, given yeah. if you value the autonomy of what you do? Uh, that, it, it's yes and no. I think the thing with me and what I actually work with Sean, who runs Point Blank Group, who's talking later today, and we've really, because I don't have management anymore because I am a manager and I'm, I'm really good at organizing myself. <laughs> I love yeah, it. I am. Um, and so I, I did ad address that that was where I fall short. And I think maybe as an ABC staff member, we're kind of used to not being able to get paid for stuff. <laughs> Sorry, ABC. Um, but, but you know how it is. We're, we're limited by taxpayers' funding. So I just would say yes to stuff I wanted to do without knowing my, my kind of return and mm. market value. Um, and, and I think that's really helped. However, um, I have said no to a lot because I have had some really organic stuff happen. So Nike and the Matildas, that was something they found I could play football. Um, I grew up with the sport. I had to say no to a crazy campaign because I was at the Champions League in Paris. Like, and I think I just ticked all these authentic boxes for them yeah. in a nice way. And then I, I actually, because Australia is small um, and 
you know, I have friends now in these companies, friends now working these brands, and and I, you have to just maintain a nice working relationship. I, I obviously I do some stuff that. Um, well, I, I've been pretty selective. Um, mm. I, the pandemic's hit uh, all artists pretty hard yep. and labels. Like, and that's the whole point of today, too. Yep, exactly. To be able to work out how we can move forward and nurture these relationships, but to the benefit of not just the partnership that you make or the brand that you're dealing with, but so for the we, artists as well. We, how can we do this together? Yeah. And I think you're a perfect example yeah. of somebody who manages that balance yeah. beautifully. Well, that's good. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I try to be. And I think the one thing you also uh, have to be really imp like conscious of is how you look to your audience because I still am front facing. I still am in Las Vegas, even though I might be pushing you know, some other artists to do work um, with brands that I don't necessarily have to post. I have to make sure that they feel the same way, that mm. they're proud of their output. Um, I think that I have taken those values, built those relationships. And then also just kind of spread the word that I have a little more control and creativity than the usual artists. Like, so for example, I run a record label that's independent, that's mostly unpublished. So that means that I work with um, a lot of sync opportunities, a lot of one-stop opportunities, and I make that really clear to the artists. I make that really clear to the sync companies. I work with Gaga in Melbourne and um, ThinkSync in the UK, and we, really prioritize that understanding that like, you know, you can get me, but you can also get access to almost 150 tracks mm. that we have pretty simple copyright to clear. And I think when you're talking about new ways to share music, new ways to earn income, sync and track alliance. So what like, does that mean, sync and track alliance? Okay, Is that so like, for those that yeah, don't know? I mean, not many people do, just music so ridiculously fucking complex in terms of, I think it's really behind. I think that when a song is out, it's a songwriter and then a, a master owner and there's two different sides and you could have up to like 50 people controlling just a grab of 30 seconds. And I think that stops a lot of um, movement because everyone's working fast and like mm. agencies, you know you work fast, <laughs> like you want that turnaround straight away. And I think that that puts, you know, a lot of pressure on people to have those avails those quick clears straight away. So for us, in a brand perspective, I, I do get people ask about, can we, you know, we had an opportunity where NLV Records, which is female run with a majority of female artists on, on the label, uh, a female run company hit up and said, can we do, can we, can we work with you guys for soundtracking our app? basically mm. a really good idea for start a pandemic you know like yeah. it, it was of course this would be great but if you're going to boast a pickup of 40,000 like membership who are paying a certain amount of money like you cannot ask an artist to to give away their music yes for music that's going to be less than what their lawyers are going to be paid so I think that's, that's the thing you've always got to know your value yeah. and and doing things for free and for exposure is you have to be very careful about those decisions whether or not it's of value in the future, yeah. you don't want to be doing everything for free no. because then it's an essentially... An artist management and an artist career is so different to basically an agency mm. world or an understanding, even influencers. Like, the, I could imagine influencers in a, in a very, you know, the usual, I don't, sorry, I don't, if the category of, inf like, <laughs> they are asking the questions, how many people, what's the budget, how long? That stuff was also new to me, and I think now coming on, like, you know, I'm not a music lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, I'd love to be, no time, um, but I, I <laughs> yeah, do Yeah, you've think, got a few things on, yeah. I think you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but I think it's really important to know those questions, like, how many people are going to see it, where's it going to be seen? Basic stuff that agency and, you know, um, producers know that artists don't, and mm. that's my one thing that I, I've learned over the years that I really, you know, I, I'm all for... I'm all for getting fed. Like, if someone wants to do it, you and me both, mm. we very much are like, it's hard out there. If you get that opportunity, do it if it makes sense. Like, some, some corporate collaborations are so weird, but you don't need to say that because the audience isn't going to react. Yeah. <laughs> but the good ones, they work. And what is it about the good ones that work? Is it that a brand has taken the time to understand what the artist is about and seen that they're 
is an ability for those two to align in a creative I way. I think so, and I think, I mean, for me as someone who's in the latter half, not latter half, like I hope it's not ending in 10 years. Um, <laughs> you're, in the, you're in the prime of your, yeah, your career. while I'm in this career right now, I think that I know my worth and I know where I'm at and I know the audience. I may not have 150,000 followers, but I have a very core 70,000 that have to happen to be almost my age mm. that have a bit more money. So like I can, like I would reach a certain amount of people that say a younger influencer or artist may not. Mm. I am also selective. So if people see me doing something, I, I would like to think that they trust my judgment because I haven't been that person that have said yes to everything. Mm. Like I've done very few brand pub, pub, uh, like collaborations public facing. And I think in the, you know, I. I worked, I have an ongoing relationship with Nike Football because I really passionately care about the Matildas. And I worked with FFA around um, Football Federation Australia around the World Cup bid. And that was me just saying yes. And I just did it. I did a couple of posts. They shot a nice video. But that was me just proving how passionate I was about the values. Mm. And that's led on to such an understanding that, well, I do care about this. Yeah. So I will put in that extra work. And that collaboration, all my friends from home knew I played football, all my, like, it was known about me and then really brought to light. And from that, I feel really confident about where I want to be with those partnerships. Like, yeah. I want the Matilda to know that my hand is up, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the same with the partners. And, and, and excitingly, like, you know, they may have got smashed a couple of weeks ago, but I was able to be part of that broadcast with them and it didn't feel like a partnership it yeah. felt it felt like I was a value it's natural yeah and you were adding value yeah. to something that you believed in yeah and and well let's talk about what they got you to do um, for the Matildas there was there was music the, involved yeah. so that was initially through Music Copa and Nike and so a bunch of artists female identifying worked on had a writing day and we made two songs for the Matildas before the World Cup um, and then we selected one, and then we we kind of worked together. In the end, it was uh, KLP, me, Coda Banks, Nina Jirachi, Grace is on the song, Tandy had written a bit. So there was a bunch of us that had worked together on, on it. I mean, that was like, pff, shout out the lawyers involved in that, because I think that was a bit of a blueprint for how yeah. this stuff worked, because it, music's so, again, it's so complicated, and like, um, it's business, you know, and creativity, especially songwriting, is business, annoyingly, and yeah. and you have to you have to work out who gets what what the master, the fee involved. However, we got there. It's great. There's now this wonderful song out, everything we ever dreamed of, that mm. the girls were able to support, that Nike could blast, that the Matildas could blast, that we could do press around, and yeah, I don't think any of us. It was a really nice experience. Mm. Oh, complicated, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but not in my end. <laughs> yeah. The teams around it. But I, I loved it. And um, the girls... You're proud of it, obviously. Yeah. And, and I mean, to, isn't that the ideal situation? If, you, if you're going to work with a company or a business yeah. or a partner or whatever, the ideal situation is that you're actually yeah. mutually kind of believe totally. in each other. Totally. As opposed to just plonking someone because they're a face yeah. or a name more kind of aiming for an alignment of, of values. Yeah. And, and I think me particular, not necessarily all the artists I work with or manage, yeah. I am someone that is behind the scenes so I can be part, an integral part of that mm. development of the idea and the understanding of the outcome. So if someone's going to come to me and say, let's put a mix together, yeah, that's a great idea. If you want to do the royalty work, okay, we'll do the royalty, like how are we going to clear this? Yeah. And I know how to do this, then I can add that to my like, I don't expect everyone to know that knowledge that I've had, like, a decade learning about mm. and where to go to and how to do this. Or the fact that, you know, Apple Music have a really exciting new way to upload mix it. Like, you know, there are ways Spotify have talked to music. There's just so many ways that you have to spend kind of years researching to go with. Or maybe yeah. not years, but, like, it's an, it, it hasn't felt like research to me because I've just been learning it. Yeah. Um, you're a woman in the music business and Am dance. I? Yes, <laughs> yes. I hate to, I, you know, I hate to spell it out. But dance music, the narrative has changed significantly over the last couple of years. Yep. There are more women. 100%. Previously, it was. I mean, when when it sort of blew up in the '90s, yeah. it was mostly men. Yeah. Um, and have you found 
now that that has um, changed the narrative around um, people seeking women for campaigns? Has it helped or is it still in its infancy? Look, you know, in an ideal perspective, we're a rarity. So yeah. for me, I feel like that's our, that's our point of calling. Like, you know, sometimes I'm that person that looks at like, hey, there's one person on the lineup. Well, that one girl on the lineup better own it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, it's a lot of pressure though, yeah, isn't it's it? it's a lot of pressure. Um, I think that it is generally changing. I think, you know, the core word of diversity and inclusion, it's stepped into brands all like quite a lot. And it's exciting to see those niche markets mm. met with people of color and actual cool kids that exist, not, you know, someone pretending to be that. Uh, but yeah, I do think it has changed. I think the story, like, you know, where I'm in the age with peers who are having kids and families, like, I think as a late night DJ and hard worker, I have a pretty similar sleep schedule as some mums. So, <laughs> so I think that maybe, like, I have the women in my feed being like, oh, living by care, you know, yeah, or yeah. love what that, or love this song. And I think that should be welcomed. And yes. the story can change and, and not necessarily be about the hardships of new motherhood, which mm. often happens with women our age. And like dance music is not ready, like they're trying to be, but, <laughs> but they don't make it a welcoming space too much for pregnant women or new mums to work late at night. Yep. But I do think that I luckily, before the pandemic, was in this kind of behind the scenes world that I was able to like, I actually want people to know more that I am, you know, I'm the busy peep now looking after Daft Punk. Like, yeah, I, I am, I want to be that figure. I want to be that powerful person. Like, you said that billboard was kind of wild for me because I'd never sit back and just go, oh my God. Yeah. Like, that seemed like, I, I was just like, why the fuck am I there? <laughs> but everyone around you knows that you deserve it. Well, and and, and we know yeah, the hard work that you've put in. And the in. campaign was about listening more. It wasn't yeah. necessarily about, it wasn't about, hyping up someone new like I'm not someone new but I can be someone exciting and and creative and boundary pushing like I'll always be that annoying older sister I love it I love it well I'm your annoying older sister as well actually yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um can, can you give us some, some advice because we've got to wind up in a couple yeah. of minutes but if there were younger artists and and they were keen to do partnerships yeah. what advice would you give them if a brand came to them wanting to yeah. you know use their music or use their profile or, or oh, whatever like what's what what, what lawyer, would be the lawyer, things lawyer, you say lawyer lawyer yeah <laughs> i mean I, I mean it's so annoying because they're so expensive but we actually have a nice system in australia where you don't have to give them a constant commission so you know you i think the first thing if you don't have a team you throw back at the offer and say can you lay it all out for me like don't do work for for a company, ask them to come to you with the proposal and then maybe ask them to pay for the lawyer, you know, like get that approval in writing. I think as well, know your worth, but I, I really do think that it's okay to say no to some things. And if it feels wrong and you don't want to post it, it's kind of like, you know, if you don't tell your friends you've hooked up with that guy, don't do it. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? I love that. That's a great analogy. Yeah, don't work with them if yeah. you feel a bit awkward. And I'm not saying don't take the back. Like, I think in a pandemic, we all have to be very forgiving about the decisions that young artists make, young managers, young... Like, we are all, you know, I, I, like, I can't speak for agencies, but I'm sure there's some smaller budgets mm. and everywhere so I think we all as a community as an Australian community have to be open for those conversations and be realistic but also like yeah that trust your gut too because you've got to remember that if someone's asking to do this that means that other people will too mm. like you're not a rarity if some campaign comes to you yeah. it's like back to you know dating if they think you're cute other people are going to think I love this analogy um and if agencies are looking at using young creatives yep. and working collaboratively with them what would be your best advice for the agencies or the, the the brands or groups I think the timing is hard because like I think we often have to be approved straight away and do all this stuff like that can only work sometimes and if you're working with um, smaller communities and minority groups like you have to understand different ways of people working like don't expect the same thing that you would as mm. an agency from a young artist who's working out who they are yeah. so like I think that understanding like we're still people and we still want the cash like we still want it but we just can't 
the pressure and the decisions, like, you know, with my artists, like, having to turn things around in a day, like, God, that everyone's just kind of trying to find out who, who mm. they are post-COVID. And also probably, you know, trying to just make money regularly yeah. outside of music totally, these days, totally, too. Totally. So it, you can't be as responsive. It can't just happen immediately. These things take time and, and to appreciate yeah, and that And don't time. be afraid to team up. Like, I'm seeing some amazing um, agencies that are focusing on linking brands with music, don't be afraid to explore that because your manager, if they're new, which is great, might not know everything as well. So ask around and yeah, don't sell yourself too short, mm. but also take the money as well. <laughs> I, I just think like that we can't be too fussy and, well, sorry, I, I take that back. We can't be too judgmental about people's decisions. Yeah, and I think this is a great opportunity for, for both sides to actually come up with creative ideas yeah, and creative. work together. Yeah, and niche markets work, man. Like, uh, like the, there's so much power in finding the smaller community because you might get someone with a huge following and then look at the engagement. Like, I don't have to have the apps to see that some people it's with no engagement. No They've engagement. They've got lots of followers, but no one, exactly. no one clicks anything. But you know, that smaller artist, that person in that, like, you should just, even some of the smaller artists I work with, the shares and the, the community that the brands want do it mm. organically. It's wild. Um, Nina Las Vegas, it's been amazing. <laughs> and I think everyone now can see why I find you one of my most inspiring, oh, inspiring you. friends. You, yeah, you, we were on Foursquare first, do you remember? We were. <laughs> <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> she spelled her name wrong. <laughs> And she calls me that now forever more. Well, hardy. Well, hardy. <laughs> um, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to Mainstage for having thank us in Las Vegas, everybody. Well done.